There was a master come unto the earth, born in the holy land of Indiana, raised in the mystical hills east of Fort Wayne. The master learned of this world in the public schools of Indiana, and as he grew, in his trade as a mechanic of automobiles. But the master had learnings from other lands and other schools, from other lives that he had lived. He remembered these, and remembering became wise and strong, so that others saw his strength and came to him for counsel. The master believed that he had power to help himself and all mankind, and as he believed, so it was. So others saw his power and came to him to be healed of their troubles and their many diseases. The master believed that it is well for any man to think upon himself as a son of God, and as he believed, so it was. And the shops and garages where he worked became crowded and jammed with those who sought his learning and his touch, and the streets outside with those who longed only that the shadow of his passing might fall upon them and change their lives. It came to pass, because of the crowds, that the several foremen and the shop managers bid the master leave his tools and go his way, for so tightly was he thronged that neither he nor the other mechanics had room to work upon the automobiles. So it was that he went into the countryside, and people following began to call him Messiah and worker of miracles. And as they believed, it was so. If a storm passed as he spoke, not a raindrop touched a listener's head. The last of the multitude heard his words as clearly as the first, no matter lightning nor thunder in the sky about. And always he spoke to them in parables. And he said unto them, Within each of us lies the power of our consent to health and to sickness, to riches and to poverty, to freedom and to slavery. It is we who control these and not another. A millman spoke and said, Easy words for you, Master, for you're guided as we are not. You need not toil as we toil. Man has to work for his living in this world. The master answered and said, Once there lived a village of creatures along the bottom of a great crystal river. The current of the river swept silently over them all, young and old, rich and poor, good and evil, the current going its own way, knowing only its own crystal self. Each creature in its own manner clung tightly to the twigs and rocks of the river bottom, for clinging was their way of life, and resisting the current, what each had learned from birth. But one creature said at last, I am tired of clinging, though I cannot see it with my eyes. I trust that the current knows where it is going, and I shall let go and let it take me where it will. For clinging, I shall die of boredom. The other creatures laughed and said, You fool, let go, and that current you worship will throw you tumbled and smashed across the rocks, and you will die quicker than boredom. But the one heard them not, taking a deep breath, did let go, and at once was tumbled and smashed by the current across the rocks. Yet in time, as the creature refused to cling again, the current lifted him free from the bottom, and he was bruised and hurt no more. And the creatures downstream, to whom he was a stranger, cried, See a miracle, a creature like ourselves, yet he flies. See the Messiah come to save us all. And the one carried in the current said, I am no more Messiah than you. The river delights to lift us free, if only we dare let go. Our true work is this voyage, this adventure. But they cried the more, Savior, all the while clinging to the rocks and twigs of the river bottom. When they looked again, he was gone, 
and they were left alone to make legends of a savior. And it came to pass when he saw that the multitude thronged him the more day on day, tighter and closer and fiercer than ever they had, he saw that they pressed him to heal them without rest and to feed them always with his miracles, to learn for them and live their lives for them. He went alone that day onto a hilltop apart, and there he prayed. He said in his heart, Infinite radiant is, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Let me lay aside this impossible task. I cannot live the life of one other soul, yet ten thousand cry to me for life. I'm sorry I allowed it all to happen. If it be thy will, let me go back to my engines and my tools and let me live as other men. A voice spoke to him on the hilltop, a voice neither male nor female, neither loud nor soft, a voice infinitely kind. And the voice said unto him, Not my will, but thine be done. For what is thy will is mine for thee. Go thy way as other men, and be thou happy on the earth. Hearing this, the master was glad and gave thanks and came down the hilltop humming a little mechanic's song. And when the crowd thronged him and pressed him to solve its woes and beseeching him to heal for it and to learn for it and to feed it nonstop from his understanding and to entertain it with his wonders, he smiled upon the multitude and said pleasantly unto them, I quit. For a moment the multitude was stunned, dumb with astonishment. And he said unto them, If a man told God that he wanted most of all to help the suffering world, no matter the price to himself, and God answered and told him what he must do, should the man do as he was told? Oh, of course, master, cried the many. Should be pleasure for him to suffer the tortures of hell itself, should God ask it. No matter what those tortures, nor how difficult the task, honor to be hanged, glory to be nailed to a tree and burned, if so be that God has asked, said they. And what would you do, the master said unto the multitude, if God spoke directly to your face and said, I command that you be happy in the world as long as you live? What would you do then? The multitude was silent. Not a voice, not a sound was heard upon the hillsides across the valleys where they stood. The master said unto the silence, In the path of our happiness shall we find the learning for which we have chosen this lifetime. So it is that I have learned this day, and choose to leave you now to walk your own path as you please. And he went his way through the crowds and left them and returned to the everyday world of men and machines. We mentioned yesterday we want a new world view. We want to shift the way we perceive the world. We want to shift our goals for the world. We want to shift our personal understanding. 2012 is all about the shift. That's not a joke. That's not somebody's fantasy. The end of the Mayan calendar to the Mayan people, to the Hopi people, to the indigenous tribes all over the planet, the end of the Mayan calendar means the end of pain and suffering. If you wish to continue pain and suffering, you get to go somewhere else. If you want to stay on this planet, you will learn to be happy. Okay. Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. How are you going to know what your bliss is? 
Your ego does not know what your bliss is. The ego is that part of us which believes itself to be separate from God. That part of us which thinks it has to fend for itself, has to work hard, has to push away the bad, migrate towards the good. Okay. The ego believes that the more education it has, the better off it's going to be. The ego says authority figures in society know something. Politicians know something. Economic uh, professors know something. Doctors know something. The ego is, by its own definition, the ultimate formula for pain and struggle. If you believe you are responsible for your own life, you will experience pain and struggle. If you believe you are responsible for taking care of yourself, you will experience pain and struggle. Can we imagine a God who says, it is my pleasure to give you the kingdom and does not say, if you work hard, if you get educated, if you believe the authority figures. The parents, the guardians who raised you did the very best they know how, just as you did the very best you know how in raising your children. They knew nothing, we know nothing, until we change our mind. We must change our mind. We must be willing to release every belief system we have ever held about everything if we want to be happy. <clears throat> to the ego, that is the ultimate terror. Now, wait a minute. I've built my whole life believing I knew what was right and what was wrong, and you're going to tell me there is no duality and there is no right and wrong? Absolutely, there is no duality and there is no right or wrong. Now, we admit it is not easy, and except in a few cases, it is not instantaneous to make that shift. Some people have made that shift instantaneously when they had a vision, when they had a miraculous experience. But most of us take a little while, okay? So we're going to be gentle with ourselves. Okay. It is possible to be 100% happy while still in a body living on this planet. You are here to be truly helpful. That is your mission. That is why you enrolled in this school in the first place. You are not special. You're a light worker. You're a healer. You're going to change the world. But you're not special. You're just God like everybody else. We're all just God. Some people feel better by saying, I'm a child of God. But if you're a child of a human, doesn't that make you a human? If you're a child of God, you're God. You are the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent creator of this universe. Your five physical senses cannot verify that for you. You have to give that up. You have to give up saying, my five physical senses teach me about the ultimate reality. I can become wise by watching how things happen and not making mistakes that other people make. That's a joke. You have no chance of becoming wise by watching other people who are struggling, who are lost. You become wise by using your inner senses. 
you have the five outer senses, you have the five inner senses plus infinitely more. If you will view the world with your inner senses. Why do all these master teachers, why do all these gurus and swamis, and who, why do they say meditate? Why does Eckhart Tolle say stop thinking? Thinking to us is our salvation. That's the way we stay on guard. Is that good? Is that bad? Let me analyze that. Hmm, is that going to get me? Does that feel safe? Wow. We're trying to figure out if something is going to harm us, and we have no clue as to what that something is. All we see is the outer shell of things here. We don't see the interior of anything. People bother us and we wonder, why are they so mean to us? Why can't they figure out what's going on? Why can't they understand? Why can't they do it my way? And all we're looking at is an outer shell. We have no idea what motivates them, where they come from, what they're here to learn, what they're here to teach us. So we want to shift how we see the world. We want to shift. 2012 is the greatest opportunity that has ever presented itself, ever presented itself in the millions of years of the history of this planet. It's the greatest opportunity that has ever presented itself to the individuals on this planet to attain enlightenment. Over the past million years, one person out of the billions on the planet would become awake every 10,000 years. And we would put them on a pedestal and we would emulate them and we would try to say, boy, that's the best teachings. Lao Tzu, okay, let's all become Taoists, right? Or Buddha, let's become Buddhists. Or Christ, let's become Christians. Or whatever. We got the factory rolling, the mass production line going, the energy has shifted, the Kali Yuga, which the Buddhists refer to as the Dark Age, the Kali Yuga, is over. Okay? Can you imagine anybody enrolling? Think about this planet. Think about this planet. What is this planet made of? War, anger, bickering, judgment, confusion, disease, death. Can you imagine anybody saying, I think I'll incarnate somebody somewhere. Where should I go? Well, I think I'll pick Earth. That looks like total hell. <laughs> right? Nobody in their right mind, if our logical mind was our right mind, would choose to come here. Nobody escapes pain and suffering here. Nobody escapes the dark night of the soul here. That's what this is all about. This is a school. Now when students enroll in schools, don't they know they're going to have homework? Don't they know they're going to have to take tests? Don't they know there's a chance they might fail a class? That's what we know before we come here, right? We made very wise decisions to come here. We made very wise decisions to choose when we chose our parents. We made very wise decisions when we chose our siblings when we chose our neighbors, when we chose our talents that we were going to use in this life, our abilities, when we chose what we were going to repress in this life. There is nothing you have ever experienced that was not a gift from God to awaken you, to turn you into a healer which this planet would need. Every dark night of the soul you went through, 
you can, in retrospect, look back and say, I exited that situation as an entirely different being. I understand humanity so much more now. I understand those that I came here to heal in a way that I could not have understand, understood if I had not gone through that experience. Every Alcohol Anonymous counselor was an alcoholic. How would they understand the people they're helping if they hadn't done that? So today we're going to look at the emotional issues that we have not completed yet, and we're going to clear them. And we will come out of that as miracle-working healers for planet Earth. It's not a mistake. We go through a negative experience or see a negative experience coming and we try to push it away. That's what the ego does. It's the only approach the ego knows. The ego can't say, this is for my benefit. Okay? The ego believes, it's hard to imagine, but the ego believes in tragedy. Can you believe that? Would God allow tragedy? Hard questions. I've always believed I've gotten part of my self-worth from understanding that I am a compassionate person. We think we're a little step above many people on the planet because we have compassion. Because we do want to end hunger. We do want to end disease on the planet. We do want to end poverty on the planet, right? So we say, I'm compassion. I'm, it makes me feel good, right? If you believe that those things are tragedies, that's not compassion. Thoughts create reality. The ego cannot comprehend that. There are certain things that the ego cannot comprehend, so we just give it up. Right? The Course in Miracles tells us, you may not understand anything in this book, and you may actively resist everything in this book. That's all right. Just keep going. Just keep reading. Okay? The ego will resist awakening. The Course also says that enlightenment is the most terrifying experience you will ever have. Because it knows. It's terrifying to the ego to not be an individual. I have to be an individual. That's where my self-worth comes from, an educated individual, a know-it-all individual. Right? To be happy, we have to learn we are not individuals. There's just one. There's not two or three or twenty or seven billion. There's just one. There is no one on this planet, including all the people that you are going to be healing, who is not you. Did I mention the mental shelf? <laughs> you need this mental shelf to place concepts that make no sense to you, okay? That means you don't have to judge them as right or wrong, crazy, silly, whatever. Just put them on the mental shelf and leave them for later. Okay. Now, you are not special. That's very, very true. Because everybody on the planet is God. So we're all the same. Right? But you are not normal either. You know you are not normal. Nobody wants to be normal. Normal on this planet means average, means pain, suffering, struggle, right? Fighting your way for survival. Okay. So we don't want to be normal in an ego sense. We want to be normal in a divine sense. You are normal in a divine sense. You are God. You can't do anything about that. Sorry. 
Okay. Richard Bach wrote Illusions, which he wrote that, I don't know how many years ago, but it's still my favorite book. All right. I understand they're going to make a movie out of it. And he didn't write it, you know. He just says, I heard it. I wrote it down. Yeah. So this Messiah walking around saying, in the path of our happiness shall we find the learning for which we have chosen this lifetime. I like that kind of school. I came to learn, but how do I learn? By always choosing the path that feels the best. Feels the best. Abraham says, the emotional guidance system will get you home. Okay? So if you stop and think a moment, we're used to reacting. That's what the ego does. It reacts to what's in its face. Okay? Here comes a problem. How do I handle that? What am I going to do next? Look at my database. Okay? See if there's a solution there. What am I going to do? Of course, you often end up in no-win situations that way because the database only contains your history. It doesn't contain how to solve a new problem. It only contains the past. We see only the past. Yeah. Well, we have access to infinite solutions. There is no problem that you and God together can't handle. Yeah, it's very easy that way. The ego has agendas, and the ego's agendas lead to pain and struggle. The ego always has agendas. If you're looking for an answer and it says, first you've got to do this, and then you've got to do this, and then you've got to do this, you're on the wrong path. Spirit has no agendas. Spirit just is. If you merge with spirit, you just are whole, complete, happy, ecstatic, joyful. Okay. Spirit does not solve problems. <coughs> spirit recognizes the truth behind the problem, and the problem disappears. Now, it's amazing how many people have these great spiritual experiences. If I was to ask everybody, what kind of spiritual experiences have you had in this life? There would be many spoken here. We had magic moments when we got some, so this, 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 this. But you had 10 million additional spiritual experiences that you didn't even recognize because the ego wants to say, no, that didn't happen. We're facing a problem. I really don't know what I'm going to do about that. And because of some random act out here, the problem got solved in some other way, and we say, boy, I was lucky that time. Okay? Lucky is another name for Holy Spirit. Okay? Boy, I lucked out there. Man, you know, the right thing happened at the right moment. Wasn't that a magnificent coincidence? Coincidence is another name for Holy Spirit. We were listening to some talk on the way down, and the guy said, coincidence is the way that God remains anonymous. Okay. <clears throat> we do have an emotional guidance system, and we're going to use it. Starting today, we're going to look at our futures. We're going to say, my past has left me with emotional issues that I haven't 100% resolved. How do I resolve that? My future looks like it's still got challenges ahead. How do I turn all of that into the path of happiness? And we use our emotional guidance system to do that. Every time you have a decision to make, you decide, I will not figure out how to solve this problem. You do not want to try to solve a problem, no problem, any problem ever again. You have no information with which to base a solution on. You know, our, our way of solving problems, look in the database, 
Look at the knowledge I have accumulated over a lifetime of struggle and pain. See if anything matches this problem. Can I extract that solution and apply it to this problem? You know, it's all logic. A teacher told me if I did this, it'd work, or somebody said that, it would work, or whatever. That will lead to more struggle. We're believing that the problem is real. If you believe that the problem is real and your belief system is creating your reality, we know what you're creating. More of the same problem. I've watched healer after healer burn themselves out. They've studied Reiki, or they've studied Shiatsu, or they've studied this or that or the other, and they work on people, and they're exhausted. For one simple reason. They believe that the client has a problem. <coughs> Whoops. They believe it's their job to help the client out of the problem. Whoops. Pain and struggle. Any healing that does happen to occur will be temporary because this powerful healer believed the problem was real. That means we're going to recreate the problem. When you work on other people, the first thing you know about them is they are God. God has no problems. How did Jesus heal people? How does John of God, this magnificent guy from Brazil or wherever he is, travels all over? Thousands of healings every year. He has never acknowledged that anybody had a problem. We're going to talk about words today, too. One of those good words is sin. There's so many words that we don't like because of our upbringing, right? Maybe you don't like the word God because, you know, people told you God is, God is love, God is this, God is that, and then you look at the world and you say, no, it doesn't fit. If there was a God of love, there wouldn't be war. You know, there wouldn't be this, so we just tune that out. Very logical. Right. Sin is an Aramaic word that means, was an archery term. It means to miss the mark. Try again. <coughs> okay? So every time we miss the mark, we try it again. That's all it's saying. That's what that word means. Okay? Well, we don't want to be the healer. We don't want to be the fixer. We want spirit to do all that for us. You know, spirit does a few tricks. Spirit can see tomorrow. Isn't that pretty amazing? Spirit knows what's going to happen to you tomorrow. Spirit know you, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. How could you guide yourself around a problem? You don't even know the problem's going to be there in the morning. Right? Spirit knows. 4.07 tomorrow afternoon, you're going to be in a fender bender in the middle of town. It's going to be a pain. It's going to be a struggle. Da, da, da. And Spirit can just tell you, hey, turn right here. Don't go to that intersection. Go around here. Right? Spirit knows the future. We don't want to make decisions about our future. It would just be really stupid to make a decision about our future when we can't see the future. Okay? So Spirit uses this emotional guidance system. Spirit says, if it feels completely peaceful, it's the right decision. If it has an agenda, it's your ego and you really don't want to go there. Okay? How many times will Spirit bail you out when you make ego-based decisions? Spirit never gets tired of bailing you out when you have, make ego-based decisions. But you have to be willing to allow spirit to do that. And spirit will never impinge upon your free will. Spirit will also always say, here's the idea, accept it or not. We have to be intuitive beings. In a few years, not too many, we will be teaching intuition in our schools, in our churches. Right? Politicians who hold debates 
trying to use the intellect and the logical mind to convince us that their way is best, will simply be ignored. It just is not even interesting to watch somebody drive their car into a brick wall at 90 miles an hour, which they're all doing. No politician has ever solved a problem yet and never will solve a problem. Everybody we elect, we say, oh, why did I do that? Right? There are no answers unless you use the intuition. The intellect does not supply answers. Authority figures rely on answers, on, on the intellect, on logic, to get their answers. No authority figure has ever had an answer that will work for you. Okay? I look at my parents, and there's two sides. My mother was so loving, so protective, so caring. I was so blessed to have her for a mother. And everything she tried to teach me about how the world works was complete nonsense. <laughs> complete nonsense. You know, she was a wonderful woman. And she believed what her parents had told her. And they believed what their parents had told them. I remember coming home from school one day and asking my mother, why are the Negroes in the back of the bus? And she said, oh, it's like salt and pepper. We belong together, but not in the same shaker. And I had heard her mother say that. That was generation after generation after generation of training, right? I would present things, ideas to her, and she was very honest. She would just simply say, I'm not ready for that yet. Now, I don't know where she came up with that or how she had that idea, but that's what she would tell me. You know, I gave her an Edgar Cayce book, and I am not ready for that, you know. I could say certain things that she would accept, but the mind holds on to its training. We all function with learned behavior. We are no different than the most prejudiced person on the planet. We have learned behavior, and we cherish it. We learn things from parents, from school teachers, from Churches, ministers, preachers, priests, <clears throat> rabbis. We hold on to that. And they were just ego-based students in planet Earth. Okay? Every master teacher, think about what master teachers tell us. <clears throat> I believe Jesus said, if you see a problem, pray ye one for another. He didn't say fix it. He didn't say solve the problem. He didn't say figure out what's wrong. No master teacher ever acknowledged that anything was wrong. Because nothing is wrong. Any more than it's wrong for a student to be taking an exam in the math class. It gets them where they want to go. There is nothing wrong. There is no tragedy. If God is love and God is all-powerful, there is no tragedy. Now, if that can sink in within the next 10 years, you're home free. Okay? That's a good one for the mental shelf. We're so immersed in the definition of compassion that other people gave us. When compassion is really... If it doesn't heal, it's not compassionate. And since thoughts create reality, a thought that there is a problem is not healing the problem. A thought that that person is healed <coughs> heals the problem. You know, Jesus never asked people to fill out their history form when they came for healing. He says, do we have your background here? He never asked them if they had insurance. 
right? Do you have an HMO, right? He simply asked one question, if he asked anything. Do you believe I can do this? If they said yes, on to the next thing. We're healed. We're gone. That's history. Who cares? Move on. Hmm. Your emotional guidance system. Think just for a moment about a challenge you have right now. It could be a small one or a big one. Something coming up that you're going to have to make a decision about. Okay? Think of possible solutions that you might know. Go through each one. Does it feel like work is involved? Stress is involved to get that solution? Or does it feel 100% peaceful? If you can't come up with the peaceful one, what do you do? Read a book, go to school, get more education. No. Meditate. Pray. Walk out in nature. Look at the stars. When the monkey mind that's always chattering goes on vacation, the answers pour in. But we're afraid to stop the monkey mind. That's where my answers always come from. I've got to figure it out. Yeah. Put the monkey mind on vacation. And whew, wait for one of those solutions that feels peaceful. Now there's another challenge. As soon as you get that, you will question the validity of that answer because you're don't, not going to see how it's going to play out until you allow it to play out. And if I can't see it all the way to the end, I'm not going to go that way. There's a reason that the ego does not see the future. If the ego could see the future, it would be even harder for us to let go of the ego because we'd think we could solve more problems. We don't want to use the ego to solve any problem. Now, ego is not negative. There is no negative. There's no bad. It doesn't matter that you have an ego. We have a friend, Scott Kalikstein, that says the ego is just, uh, getting rid of the ego is just another ego trip. <laughs> don't worry about the ego. We don't give power to things that we don't want. So, yeah, who cares about egos? So you got an ego. So you did something stupid an hour ago. Who cares? Doesn't matter. Right? When we are told to love each other, to love our neighbor, it is because right, we don't love ourselves. Our neighbor is a mirror image of us. If we can learn to love our neighbor, we will be loving ourself. But my mother is so controlling. She just let go and let me do my own life. Ah, uh, well, I think maybe you chose your mother and you chose her knowing she was going to be controlling so that you could release your negative energy about that and be at peace and heal your mother. Okay. Hmm. We want that emotional guidance system. I choose only the peaceful solution. Okay. So, I'm going to use tools to heal my own emotions. And you don't need to worry about healing your body. When you heal your emotions, the body follows. Where does disease come from? comes from the mind. Okay? We heal our emotions, the body will follow. And when you heal your emotions, you're going to see several other people that you're very close to who just happened to get healed at the same time. What a coincidence. Hmm. 
we heal our emotions. The only way we can do that is stop relying on the logical mind for solutions, use our intuition. That's why we meditate. That's why we walk in nature. That's why we stop the thinking mind, the busy, busy mind, right? So that we can hear the voice of God. A reporter asked Einstein at a physics conference, what is the most important question that mankind can ask? Thinking it was something about quantum physics. And Einstein said, is the universe friendly? If the universe is friendly, we do not have a problem. If the universe is not friendly, we do not have a chance. So decide that the universe is on your side and will take care of everything for you. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay. So we want to stop paddling upstream. We want to learn to let go and let God. Oh, I've seen that banner in the front of many churches. Nobody does that. I'll take care of this problem, God. You take care of the big stuff. I'll handle my life. Sorry. There is no big stuff. Mm. Okay. So we want to change the way we do things.